Hey everyone, this is Thomas from Springfield Daily. We are in the new studio in the wonderful Innovate Springfield Incubator in downtown Springfield. My guest today is Mr. Seth McMillan, a Republican running in the 48th Illinois Senate District. Thank you so much for being here. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and why are you running for state senate? Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Um, so I'm Seth McMillan. I'm from Taylorville. Uh, that's where I grew up. I own a small business and um, I have two children and um, I also spent um, uh, eight years on the Taylorville School Board and decided to run for state senate because I think we need a uh, new direction and uh, we need to, I believe, purge the system of career politicians. All right, well, as always, I want to give you the floor to talk about whatever your number one issue is. Just, if we got off right now, what would you want to have gotten said? <laughs> well, one of the, you know, one of the big issues that I'm, I'm running on is the, the fact that we have an economy and we have um, an economy that doesn't work for especially people in our generation. I've had numerous uh, friends, uh, family, um, people that have, have told me that their children are leaving Illinois to find better opportunities. Uh, I think that is the biggest issue that we need to address, and that comes down to addressing the economy. All right, so there, there's a lot of issues there. I mean, property taxes, workers' comp, um, mm -hmm. just generally building a better business climate. Is there one? Which of those do you think sort of is most important, or is there sort of a more cultural? Um, I think I think building a better business climate is the biggest thing. I think that workers' comp has a lot to uh, quite a ways to go. We have um, some politicians will tell you that they fix workers' comp, and that just isn't true. Uh, we still have a problem with rates being too high as compared to neighboring states and that's one of our biggest one of the biggest problems you know if you live um, on the border of Illinois and Indiana um, as a small business owner I would be doing whatever I could to move across the border so I could get lower rates uh, I have friends that are in business same business I'm in that are paying 25 to 30 percent less in insurance rates across state lines and that's ridiculous um, so we need to take another look at workers' comp and, and figure out how to be more in line with our competing states. All right, and also with property taxes. Um, you talk about freezing property taxes on your website. Mm -hmm. um, I've, got, I've got two questions here. Some Republicans have sort of criticized the calls for a freeze and have said that really the freeze is not the right move, that we need to ratchet them down. Is that sort of in line with your thinking, or do you think a freeze is really... I think a freeze is the first step. I think that ratcheting down, I think that that's something that could be done on the local level. I don't like the idea of, of state government um, applying, if you want to call it a mandate, to local units of government or local taxpayers. I think that we have, um, and, and we need to look at ways that uh, local voters can make changes, uh, whether it's combining local units of government, that would lower tax uh, property tax rates, um, combining school districts, things like that. But again, those are things that need to be decided on the local level. Uh, I don't want the state government um, laying out a mandate. Um, you remember, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, Pat Quinn had kind of rolled out with an idea that he was going to force consolidation of school districts. And I don't believe in that. I mean, I think that consolidating local units of government will drive down property tax um, rates, but that needs to be decided on a local level by local voters. Oh uh, yeah, because that, that actually preempted my question about it being a, a local versus state issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Senator Menard, uh, your, your primary, oh, presumably your opponent, uh -huh. um, was one of the key proponents of the new education funding bill that you've been sort of critical mm -hmm. of. Um, can you explain what your criticisms of that bill are? I think it gives too much to Chicago. Um, and, and, and it's hard to argue with that point. Um, you know, from the beginning, and, and I'll remind you, I, I was on the Taylorville School Board for eight years. Uh, I watched as, as public education was uh, prorated, general state aid, and Eddie Menard was behind that. He was there during those years, uh, either as a staffer to John Cullerton, or he was actually in the Senate and he approved appropriations that prorated general state aid. So my, 
hometown of Taylorville lost four million dollars, almost five million dollars, in general state aid. Um, so I think that um, Andy Menard is spreading a fairy tale that he is now the savior of public education when he helped to decimate it in the, in the beginning. Uh, actually, I, I want to I want to stop you for a second. You, you talked about the proration mm-hmm. and for some of our, our newer newer listeners. Uh, what what was that? Specifically? Proration is when uh, they took the foundation level funding and decided that they were only going to give ninety two percent. I believe one year we were prorated at eighty nine. So you had, in some cases, ten, eleven, twelve percent that that we were not getting, and school districts will never get that. Um, so I can tell you, and I'm, and believe me, I'm glad that the funding formula was changed. It needed to be done. Um, but school districts like Taylorville, Pena, Springfield, and District 186 would be much better off today if they were not uh, prorated general state aid. And, and like I said, I, and I'll remind everybody, Andy Menard was in the Senate during some of those years when uh, state aid was being prorated, and if he wasn't a sitting senator, he was chief of staff to John Cullerton. Um, he knew what was going on, and I think it's very disingenuous to now um, be parading around the state being a champion of education when he helped to decimate general state aid in the first place. All right, and staying on the education theme, one of the major issues people are talking about now is the inability for Central Illinois to attract qualified teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is sort of driving that problem? And Well, I'll problem? tell you what drove it in the beginning. Uh, when school districts were forced to lay off teachers, um, those teachers left and went somewhere else so they could get a job and get a job that they could depend on year after year. Um, in Illinois, um, as we went through that proration period, uh, who would want to take a job that they weren't sure would be there the following school year? That, that is the biggest thing, I believe, that started that, um, that, you know, and again, uh, my opponent is out there uh, talking about this new crisis that, you know, we're, we're short on teachers, and we are. Uh, I'm an ACT teacher. Um, I know that in Illinois, we have more ag teaching positions that can be filled. And I, but I think a lot of that that, drew, that drove that, this problem in the beginning was the fact that school districts all over the state were laying off a large amount of teachers during those five years or so when our, when our, our state aid was being prorated. All right. Um. On, on, again, staying with, staying with the education theme, of course, the state has a legal and a moral obligation to help students who are struggling, help students who have mm-hmm. learning disabilities, and of course, no one would dispute that at all. Right. But what sort of obligations do you think school districts have towards their elite students in terms of providing them with opportunities that match their talents? I think that, um, you know, I've always been, um, I've always been somebody that has kind of pulled for the underdogs myself. Um, but I, I agree with um, districts need to provide opportunity for students that excel because, and I'll give you an example. I had, um, I've had students, high school students work for me in my business and there are just, there are some, there are some students that unless they are challenged, um, they don't do well. And so uh, gifted students need just as many opportunities as students that are maybe not college bound. Right. And do you think there should be more co- uh, non-college options, uh, apprenticeships, yep. or? Yep. I'm a, like I said, I'm a vocational ag teacher. Um, I I went through the Taylorville Ag Program. Um, you know, I've I've worked. I started working when I was 13 years old, cutting grass and and landscaping and doing those things. And I believe that uh, we have a shortage of skilled labor in our country. Um, talk to some of the, the union halls and they'll tell you that um, they have an aging uh, group of, of employees, of members, and there aren't the, the younger skilled labor force that's coming up to replace some of those. So 
um, that's a big issue. And so I, yeah, I believe that uh, districts need to be teaching these vocational programs. We need building trades. We need opportunities. Now that doesn't mean that it needs to be done in house. Um, we have the career um, <clears throat> career capital, the career area career center. Is that how you? Okay. The Capital Area Career Center, I believe, is how you has, is what that is that that provides those opportunities for high school students, like from District 186. I know Taylorville sends a lot of students there to get that hands-on training, so that's very important. Um, thinking of economic development in Taylorville, mm -hmm. uh, Congressman Rodney Davis recently helped them get an educate uh, economic major economic development grant. Right. Uh, do you know anything about that project? How, how do you feel about? Projects like that from the federal level um, involved in job creation. Oh, I think I think that uh, if there's federal dollars out there, that that we need to compete for them, and that's what uh, the Taylorville Development Association did. Um, they have a uh, plans for an industrial park, and um, you know that's a um, you know we can talk about. You know, enterprise zones and things like that, TIF districts, Taylorville's working on a TIF district to try to attract, you know, we know that there are businesses um, ready to come um, if some of those things fall into place. So, um, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a business owner who has taken advantage of um, enterprise zones. So I, I, I think those are important. I think we have a little over 90 enterprise zones across the state. So. What, what specifically is an enterprise zone? An enterprise zone, uh, so it, it gives you, it gives businesses incentives. So, uh, for example, property taxes can be abated um, or incrementally charged over a 10 year period. So you have, um, when, you, when you build a new business, you don't have immediately, um, you're not paying immediately the, the property tax uh, that would be assessed on that property. Uh, sales tax breaks. So. For example, if you buy building materials to build or add on to an existing business, um, you don't pay sales tax on those materials. So um, those are the types of incentives that um, I think local governments even agree that you know it's worth uh, giving up some of that sales tax revenue if a new business is willing to expand or or you know start a new business. Um, so that's what an enterprise zone is. All right, um, and thinking on your, on your professional experiences, you are the chairman of the Christian County Republicans. Yes, I am. Uh, what what do you do in that role? Uh, chairman of Christian County Republicans. So I have um, precinct committeemen that that work with me. Um, I basically help uh, other Republican candidates at the county level, at the state level, and um, we uh, you know some of the some of the tasks that. Sometimes people don't know about are uh, making sure we have election judges at, at polling places and and that type of thing. All right, um, to take a, take a more more specific tact. Um, drugs are a major issue in Illinois because mm -hmm. on the one hand we have pushes to expand medical mar mar medical marijuana and recreational marijuana, and on the other hand we have an opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. um, can I get your thoughts on either of those issues? Do they are they at odds with one another or are they Part of a bigger picture. I think it depends on who you talk to. I, I'm, you know, I need more. I, personally, I need more information on on the the marijuana side of it. Uh, right now, um, I'm I'm hearing from law enforcement who are opposed to legalization. Um, on the other hand, I have also heard um, I've also heard from people that that say that. You know that, that these two issues go hand in hand with opi with the opioid crisis as well. So, um, I think that as we move forward, and I, I don't expect that that a legalization bill is going to happen in this session. I think um, um, so. I think that as we go forward, I'm looking for more information on those issues myself. All right. Um, should Illinois be right to work? Should Illinois be right to work? I, you know. I think that Illinois needs to be more competitive. I, I'm not, um, I'm not in favor of making making the entire state right to work. I, I think again, um, and a lot of that is, we have to be realistic. Um, 
the, the Democrats have a majority in the House and the Senate. Um, that type of legislation has no chance of getting through the state of Illinois. And, and so I'm not going to, um, you know, I, I'm just not going to be somebody that champions that kind of policy when, when I know it's, it has a very low chance of happening. But what I will say is, you know, if you look at our surrounding states that we're competing against, um, that is, right to work has been, um, a, I think, a big driver in some of that uh, business, some of that growth that they've had. But there are also other issues that, uh, like uh, lower um, insurance premiums, uh, lower taxes, um, lower property taxes. Um, so there are a lot of issues. It's not just right to work in the state of Indiana that has made Indiana attractive. Um, it's like I said, lower lower taxes, lower property taxes. Um, so there are issues I think in Illinois that um, that Democrats and Republicans can come together on and and get some work done to make Illinois more competitive. I don't think right to work is one of those issues. Um, and thinking on issues that have been Republican sort of mainstays, part of Bruce Rainer's platform, but that also probably have a limited chance of success, term limits. Oh, I'm, I'm a big supporter of term limits. Um, I think one of the biggest problems that we have in Illinois are just career politicians in general. They're like, they're like a cancer. Um, we have people that have been in office um, 30 years or more. Um, I think that certainly on the federal level and on the state level as well, um, our, our founders uh, did not intend on people spending a career making um, large amounts of money benefiting personally from being in, in office. Um, we need to get back to public service in our elected positions. Um, so, you know, that's another reason I'm running. I, I, I know that getting term limits is, is going to be tough. Um, but the other thing we also need are, are fair, fair legislative maps as well, which should be done by an independent, um, should be done independently from political parties. Uh, and what, 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 what would fair maps look like? What sort of specific steps would make the maps be fair? Well, I think you're, you, you would still end up with districts that are oddly shaped, but I think what you, I think what you would have is um, you'd, have, you'd have districts that would be more competitive for both sides. So I think that would create an atmosphere where um, ideas could be debated. Um, you could, uh, people could, the voters could, could swing the district if they, if they didn't like the, the, uh, the way that the, their current legislator was doing things. Um, they could easily swing the district in a different direction. And that could happen um, because there would be more competition. It would be more of a, um, you know, I don't want to say, you know, 50-50. You're never going to get districts that are 50-50 split between Democrats and Republicans. But, um, you know, we've got to get away from this, um, these districts being drawn to protect legislators on either party. Um, and, and, you know, I know that the southern part of the, of the state, it would be hard to get a district that had a 50-50 split because it's mostly Republican now. Um, and, but when you get up into the collar counties, you get into Chicago area, um, I mean, we've, we've all seen the maps. Um, it's very ridiculous, so. Um, one, one of the major proposals coming that was, has been pushed in the, or at least presented to the House Pension Committee was a plan to sell $107 billion worth of bonds to fund the pension system immediately and then arbitrage the differing interest rates to help sort of get ahead of the pension crisis. Yeah. Is that proposal too big? Is it on the right approach? Or um, I think it, you know, it sound it sounds big. It's it sounds I think I think when you first hear it, it kind of shocks you a little bit. Um, but 
we're basically talking about refinancing, right? We're talking about trying to get lower interest rates. Um, is it the right thing to do? I have not looked into it close enough myself to give you an answer on whether that's the right thing to do or not. Um, I do know that you know they're going to have to do something to restructure um, the, the finances in the state before we get downgraded again to junk, you know, downgraded to junk status. So it's uh, um, something I'm you know I'm looking into, but I, I've seen um, some media outlets immediately portrayed it as a um, something that was dangerous and, and a bad thing. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily uh, in that position, but I don't know if it's if it's the best thing to do or not. All right, but it, but it's not conceptually out of the, out of this per, per specific proposal might not be the right one, but conceptually it's not. I, yeah, I don't think it's a. I don't think restructuring um, debt is a bad thing if you can restructure it at lower interest rates uh, to try to save the taxpayers money because ultimately the taxpayers are paying some pretty high interest rates on on the debt that these politicians have racked up over the years. All right, again, to, to switch tax a little bit again, what made you be a Republican? Why, what makes, what, um, what, what makes me that? a Republican? Well, well, why did you become a Republican? Um, you know, I've, I've always believed in, um, in limited government. Uh, I don't, I don't like it when, um, when government has a heavy hand and, and is telling people, um, and, and, and a good example would be my time on the school board in Taylorville when, you know, it was just every month or so you, we had a new proposed mandate from the state of Illinois or the state board of education was doing something that took local control away from us. And I, I just think that's wrong. And that's a big reason why I am a Republican. Um, I believe in low taxes. I believe in free enterprise. Um, I believe that free markets are the best way to um, to help people, and um, and I'm also pro-life. Um, I I think it's disgusting that we have a state senator that supports uh, taxpayer funding of abortions at any stage of the pregnancy. Um, and I'm also a big supporter of the Second Amendment. So um, I'm a gun owner. I hunt periodically. Um, I don't want, um, you know, I just don't want the government telling me that um, I don't have the right to protect myself or to, to defend my family. So I want to um, defend those Second Amendment rights if I make it to the Senate. All right. Think, thinking of the competition, uh, you talk about being on, on a school board. Mm -hmm. How, what's your opinion on charter schools, especially in a, in a period when funding for education is not perhaps where it should be? Yeah, we have, I think, a handful of charters in, in the 48th district. Uh, and, and as you know, they are still connected to public schools. Um, I just think that charters need to be held to the same standards as public schools are. Um, I don't have a problem with charters. Some of them are, are doing good things. But I want to make sure that, um, that they're being held to the same standards that other uh, public educators are. All right, and this might be this is a super technical question. How do you feel about shell bills as a, as a <laughs> legislative vehicle? Give me an example. Uh, well, for example, the process the I believe it was House Bill, no, Senate Bill zero four 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 started as a technical change, right. and then became the became the Student Identity Protection Act, and then when it came over to the House, was amended completely again mm -hmm. to become the the funding for yeah. where you have you have bills that start that pass yeah. chamber as a single word being changed right. or some right. relatively innocuous thing and then morph over time as they move between the chambers well I would rather see clean bills I mean obviously um, it, and that's what really causes a lot of uh, especially for someone who is not um, that's not familiar with the process um, when you go to look up legislation and, and <laughs> it gets very complicated and we need you know we need to have uh, open transparent uh, legislation and so yeah I, I, I'm not I'm not in favor of that that type of but that's what we see all the time yeah because it's so. yeah because 
the thing about shovels, it's not what's in them, it's, it's really the, the process of how it works. Right. Um, right. And so I guess my, my, my closer is primaries often have very, very low turnouts, mm -hmm. and you're in a fairly competitive district. What would you say, not, not to your base, not to, a, not to a Republican big R, but to an independent or a moderate to say, why should they come out on March 20th and pull that Republican ballot? Well, they should pull a Republican ballot if they believe in defending the Second Amendment, if they believe that we need to protect life, um, if they believe that we are in a we're in a position as a state that, that needs a new direction. We're overtaxed, we're overregulated, um, and and we have a we have a career politician um, that's currently there who has been part of the problem, and. He's not going to be part of the solution. He's going to do whatever the Chicago Democratic machine wants him to do. That's what he has done through his entire career. And so if people want a new direction, if they want to protect the freedoms that we have, then they need to pull a Republican ballot and they need to vote for me. And, and then, um, and, you know, this is going to be a grassroots campaign. Um, you know, the uh, Democratic majority is not going to... Uh, uh, to let this go easily. So uh, I know that this is not going to be an easy thing to accomplish, but you know, it, it is the most uh, Republican Senate district that's currently held by a Democrat. And I think that if you look at recent elections, you can see where that, di where that district has trended um, more conservative. And, and people are starting to see um, who Andy Menard really is. He has, uh, he campaigned on a conservative, um, blue dog Democrat type of platform, and yet he's been to the left on every issue um, that has come through the Senate. Uh, I remember seeing a campaign ad that Andy ran, said that people couldn't afford a tax increase. Well, he was chief of staff to John Cullerton when the first income tax increase went through, and he voted for the next one that we're at, that we're under now, and and yet, um, you know, and and you gotta love these career politicians. You know, these guys have been there for years, and and then they start campaigning and they want to act like they've had nothing to do with what's happened, and and that's what uh, this campaign's about. Is it's it's about exposing um, what the truth is and uh, giving people a choice. And do you think, I know, I know your, your two children are still quite young. Mm -hmm. Do you think by the time they are of college age that Illinois can still be a place where they'll want to stay and want to come back to? That's what I hope. I, I can tell you I have, uh, I work with about 30 high school students um, every day in an, in an FFA program in Decatur. And a lot of those seniors are leaving Illinois to go to college. And it's, it's very sad, um, number one, that they're, that they're leaving the state to go to college, but number two, it's, uh, it's unlikely that they're going to come back. Once they leave, um, what is there to attract them back to, to their hometown or to their home state? Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's one big reason why I'm running. You know, I have a small uh, family business. Uh, I would like to be able to pass that on to my children, um, but... If things don't turn around, and we're not going to tax and spend our way out of this problem, uh, like the majority party seems to think we can do, so uh, that yeah, that's a big reason why I'm running. All right. Well, this has been Seth McMillan uh, running in the Senate 48th district. Um, thank you so much for yeah, being here. Yeah, I appreciate it. And the Olympics just started. What's your <laughs> event? <laughs> What's my event? Probably. Um, I don't know. It's hard to choose one. So right, well, well, thank my, you. my daughter likes figure skating, so that's usually what we end up watching. <laughs> All right, well, th thank you so much All for right. being here. Yep. It's been great. Thanks.